and get started. Yeah, it's like six, right? Yeah. yeah. Hi. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Just for to not um, be clapping <laughs> along with the crowd. All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I'm very, very excited to introduce um, Jillian and Mariko Tamaki and to uh, be in conversation with you both in this space. Um, so just a few, uh, and my name is Julia Alexeva. I'm an assistant professor in the English department and cinema and media studies program. I also have a graphic novel called Soviet Daughter, A Graphic Revolution, and I teach um, uh, comics and graphic memoir, um, as well as uh, cinema and media studies courses. Um, so just a few housekeeping things. Um, this is the Bernheimer Symposium, established in the memory of comparative literature teacher and scholar Charles Bernheimer by a dear friend of the writer's house, Kate Levin. The Bernheimer Symposium is an opportunity to think expansively about programming here. Thanks also to Al Philrice, Jessica Lowenthal, Heidi Kalu, and Julia Paul Miranda, and Drawn and Quarterly for all of their help with today's event. Um, so how this is going to go is that I'll pass the floor to our esteemed guests, and uh, we'll have the wonderful slideshow and talk, and then I'll field um, a, a short discussion between the three of us, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, and then there'll be time to buy copies of Roaming, which is officially out today. Yes. And is incredible. Um, I was very excited to get to read it early and highly, highly recommend it. So um, with that, I'll pass it to both of you. And thank you, Julia, for stepping in because our original moderator got sick. So thank you for coming in at the last and moment. On that note, thank you for masking. <laughs> yes. We appreciate it. Um, okay, we're just going to jump right in here. Where did you come from? Who are, who are you? Who are you and where did you where, come from? What is your, like, are, are you sisters? Are you twins? <laughs> Do you live? Uh, do you live? How do you work together? How do, do you live to get like All of it. <laughs> a lot of questions? Uh, start at the very, very <laughs> basics. We are cousins. Uh, we did not grow up with one another. Uh, I grew up in Calgary, Alberta. Rico grew up in Toronto. Yes. And uh, we were not tight growing up. Uh, we would meet for funerals and weddings in Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, because you never came out west <laughs> to visit us. No. Um, <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, this is one of the, those times, I suppose, with some other little cousins blurred out. Yeah, and that's when Jillian had bangs, and I didn't have bangs, and now I have bangs, and yeah. Jillian doesn't have bangs. So things change. <laughs> uh, Roaming is our third collaboration. And I guess to start off, we're going to start with a little summation, since I'm assuming most people have not read the book. Because yeah. it just came out. Yeah. Uh, it's spring break, 2009. Friends Zoe and Danny travel from their respective Canadian universities to meet up in New York. Danny brings her, her sassy classmate, Fiona, who has visited New York, New York City before, thus making her an expert. And they settle into their dingy hostel near Penn Station. They set out to see the sights. They see art, they hit all the touristy hotspots, battle travel fatigue, eat tons of pizza, and of course, shop their asses off. Eventually, because all trips involving three people who are 19 years old always <laughs> go really well, sparks fly between Zoe and Fiona. Um, and uh, that sort of starts to change the tenor of the trip a little bit. Uh, and uh, yeah, for like at least two people in the trip, it ends up with like one really amazing night uh, in the hostel. Um, and yeah, so then it's like, you know, everything is going really great and then it's going not so great and then everything is like the worst mm -hmm. is basically the story. So we were really interested in kind of exploring like that kind of like liminal period of like the sort of beginnings of adulthood. Like you've had your life in high school and then you completely leave that behind and you're sort of starting something new and what it means to sort of like have those connections and have those connections between people change. So uh, in 2009, I started kicking around ideas for a story. Um, and really, I don't know the final format for anything. If you start it, like I do picture books. Sometimes I just put little comics on Instagram. Sometimes you're doing a short story. 
sometimes a graphic novel. Uh, yeah, those that idea like where it goes is sort of secondary to the idea the initial idea the initial idea really was the texture of travel as uh, as a young person I think it's very unique <laughs> it's like you don't uh, make the same choices as you would when you get a little bit older a little bit more experienced um, and really wanted to do something kind of freewheeling and fun. I think a lot of our books prior to that had like a somber somberness, I like always very funny, but like I think had a somberness to it. And I thought like it would be kind of fun, funny to do something very l lighter, you know, not that there was deep stuff in it, but lighter and, and actually sexy <laughs> and actually have sex in it. So I was like, what if our books were sexy? I was like, I they had yearning, <laughs> lots of yearning. Yeah, eats uh, food sexily. <laughs> eats food sexily. These are some initial sketches. Just I think this is done on like an iPad. Um, just the first figuring out the character things, you know. Um, I had taught in New York City art schools at around the time that Roaming was set, so I was around a lot of nineteen and twenty year olds at that time. Um, and I had also seen a. Um, a a review screening of like with nail and I and it was really about like a meandering story with this complicated friendship and this ex with an explosive person um, and again it'd be tr this transitional time I thought it and it, but it had that sp a spirit that I really liked and so and I actually would have forgotten this but I keep a little pr production notes like document on my like Dropbox as I'm doing the book um, so I can remember stuff for stuff like this later when I need to talk about it. Cause you just, stuff gets lost, right? You use it for part of the process and then you kind of like forget it as you move on. And it's then two years in the, in the rear view mirror. Uh, and even though we had never, <laughs> yeah, more little, um, more little uh, sketches and we had not written uh, ever towards a demographic. Sometimes the demographic finds us uh, with this one. We knew we wanted to write uh, Beyond YA, I guess it's called new adult. <laughs> Hashtag new adult. Old adult, <laughs> new adult. Yes. Middle-aged adult. Um, yeah. So 19 did feel also like we wanted to explore, like 19 is an adult, right? So like we wanted to also be able to explore that fully. And I mean, maybe also aging out of high school analyzing high school <laughs> maybe yeah. a fully processed high school yeah i mean i think at some point you've like sucked all your memories dry about like being 10 and you're like i think i got nothing left sucked all the meat I have off nothing that else bone. to say about being 12 move like, forward yeah. and unpacking your 20s yeah <laughs> and then we'll be like perimenopausal and unpacking our 30s <laughs> So uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of sketched out these loose characters like I was just showing you and some of these rough scenes that I knew I wanted to include. Like I knew I wanted to include a scene of Fiona showing these girls how to properly eat pizza because I know how to do that and you've never been here and I'm gonna teach you something. So like some of these scenes that I knew really had to be in it. And I really didn't get too far in before I realized that this was sounded like a book I would make with my cousin. It sort of fell in line with Skim and This One Summer. Um, Skim, which we had done in 2008, and uh, This One Summer we had done in 2014. Yeah, I think like we've been, it's funny because we're like memory laning this whole tour, and I do think we've been talking a lot about our sort of common themes and the sort of, you know, I think the thing is it's like, when you get asked about it, it's like the theme of identity. Although like technically all books are about yeah. identity. I don't know how that works, but mm -hmm. we are definitely interested in friendships is definitely a thing that comes up a lot and the sort of complications of the communication, pain of friendship. the pain of friendship yes. and <laughs> just like, you know, like friendship as like a training ground for like the pain of adulthood relationships, mm. you know, like if you could break up with your friend nicely, then maybe you could break up with your, you know, mm -hmm ex-wife I don't know probably not though um but like friendships is definitely a thing that we are those kind of like miscommunications between people who are close yeah it felt like it had that really intense friendship in flux interpersonal dynamics going yeah. awry vibe and I was like oh this is a book I make with my cousin yeah and we've been building skim is about sort of mostly one person and then this one summer is about this dynamic between two girls and now roaming is about three Sure. So we add one person every time. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Rico, did you want to talk about the script for this one? Yes. So uh, essentially what we had done in the past was we had like the sort of origin for Skim in this one summer was like my traumatic childhood like turned into <laughs> fiction. Um, and so this time we had talked because I think the, you know, the sort of history of like all kind of illustrated work with text is that there's this division of labor between the illustrator and the writer. And they're sort of seen as like one and then the other. And we're really in the industry, in the yeah. industry. Yeah. And there's yeah. like this sort of notion of like, we've always called ourselves co-creators. And I think that we wanted after this one summer to actually really do something together from mm -hmm. the get go. So Jillian starting the script and sending me the sort of like initial sketches and the sort of outline of sort of like something like the first day was sort of the jumping off point for us to really write together, which we were both really excited to do. So we really just, you know, people are like, how did you do it? It's like, you do it like you write everything else with someone else. You just email back and forth endlessly. Um, yes. Which I think I am sort of born into because I have always been a collaborator. Like I grew up in Toronto as like a member of the queer community. Um, I wrote a lot of plays without any training because that's what queers do is without any training we mm -hmm. do something. Um, so this is me in Toronto I think in like 2004 or something. Uh, this is like the beginning of my career as like a cabaret performer. I'm actually wearing, I realized I used to have this troupe called the Corporate Wet Nurse Association where we would do fake secretarial <laughs> training seminars. Um, <laughs> So that's why I'm wearing that suit, which I could never figure out. Uh, so yes, I basically got the chance living in Toronto, living in a city where so much of art is supported by, you know, government art councils. I got a chance to do everything. I wrote a ton of theater. I wrote, um, you know, like short films. I worked on short films, like anything that I, it's like, you know, someone would be like, do you want to make a thing with puppets? And you'd be like, sure. Yeah. So that was like my 20s, basically. I would. I live in Toronto now, but I would have loved to have lived in the Toronto in the '90s as an yeah. as an artist in the 2000s because it was cheap as hell. It like, was and cheap like, as you hell. Just like go and make your weird ass thing. Yeah, There's, a whole house yeah. for like three hundred dollars yeah. a month, kind of thing. Like that. I think that that's so important to yes. um, making artwork, and I think that spirit is still there where people are like. I'm just making this thing so like my 25 friends can come and we can get high after. Like I th I I still like that that spirit is still there, but it's harder because it's so it gets getting so expensive. It's harder. I think there's also the notion that it's like it's not like what you do for a living, so you do it because you just are very passionate about it and you want to do it. So, you know, on the one hand, it's like I grew up with people who were like, I wrote this poem on the bus on the way here, and you're like, well, that doesn't sound maybe you should edit it, you know, like, <laughs> but at the same time, it was like the stakes were really low yeah. and you could be an artist who was like, I just had this feeling and I wrote yeah. it down and I now you're all so going to listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. The stakes feel so high now. That's just a brief, mm -hmm. that's uh, a, <laughs> a tangent. Tangent um, into the Toronto art scene. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of art scenes now. The, uh, so this is a picture of the, this one summer script. Um, and so you can kind of see that it is kind of formatted like a theater script because that was your background yeah so basically it was just like not so much not not panels and and pages but very much like this is where they are and this is what they're talking about so sort of like a clarity of sort of character and sort of in interconnection but not so much visuals which is different from yes from my, what i understand superhero panel which the writer is going to be paneling every panel or right. not paneling, sorry, uh, writing every panel. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the other part of it is that, you know, comic book scripts for Marvel and DC have to be approved by a thousand people right. before anything goes forward. So the only people, like with Jillian and I, our scripts are communication between each other. Right. Like, it's really me saying to Jillian, like, this is what I think they're doing. And then you're like, oh. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Cool. Cool. <laughs> this one was a little different uh, in that we, you know, Mariko didn't go away and kind of present me this, finished thing which I love that challenge too actually I like getting coming to an understanding to a, of a thing that is fully there and trying to find my way into a thing that exists I actually enjoy that challenge with this one we did want to do it a little different given that it was my initial kernel of an idea and had started the script for it um, this is just a picture of like a screenshot of like one of the emails that we bandied back and forth for over a couple months and you know the story really took shape over um 
that process. It didn't have an outline or really anything like that. We had a brief, we had sort of a, a verbal thing of this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to go all awry and whatever. But the details of that um, were kind of hammered out in the process of actually writing together. Here's another little just comparison of what the script was and then what it ended up being. Um, and the script is never set in stone. I, it'll change to the final thing as well uh, because I, what often happens is I find that you actually don't need to say as much once you have the images there. They kind of like do some of the lifting and you can sort of edit it out. So with every uh, next stage, it, it still does keep up evolving. So uh, a little bit about my background. I went to design school, you can see. Um, and it, the program was so old fashioned, it was about half illustration anyway. I really had no clue. I just knew I wanted to do something creative and like not disappoint my family. So like a real job <laughs> that I would get a paycheck for. Uh, so that's somebody's like architectural rendering like behind me on the wall there. This must have been a critique day. I have no training in comics, just in uh, illustration and, and graphic design. So, oh, and then there's a picture of me at my first job <laughs> at uh, BioWare. <laughs> Uh, which is a video game company. And this is really in Edmonton, Alberta, which I had never lived in there, in, in that city. And uh, this is when I started making comics, like 2004, uh, 2005. And it was, I made comics about Edmonton. So I, I clearly I have some sort of fascination with the cities that I live in, you know. Also look at your water bottle, what water bottles yep. used to look like. That's, uh, <laughs> it's vintage, it's vintage, it's vintage. Cheery, very, very cheery time <laughs> of my life. Um, so, you know, with that training, I just kind of, again, naivete is such a blessing in a way. Like, just approached it like I would magazine layout, you know? That's, I think, what really informs my process. So after the script, it looks like thumbnails with little scrawls that, you know, really nobody could understand but me. Um, but this is such an important process. Um, sometimes I'll even blow these up and fold them into little books so that you, I can really s get a sense of how the story is working as an object as well. Uh, but, you know, nobody can understand those little, you know, mar marshmallow figures. So I have to bring it up to this point that we can edit it. This is in Clip Studio. And so you're plugging in the text. Again, still refining, but um, it brings it up to a point that I can have a conversation with Mariko. And that's a kind of, I mean, it's very lonely. This is like the bulk of the work, right? Um, and the bulk, bulk of the actual important work uh, where you're figuring it out how it, how it will read. I mean, the final artwork is important. This is more important. So um, a lot of time in between, I'm sh it's two slides, but that's like months and months and months of work. Uh, and that, but that's when I come up back to Mariko and we have that discussion. Yeah, I mean, we have a, I mean, there is so many, when you talk about being a comics editor, there's so many different ways to be a comics editor. There's sort of the traditional way of like, you know, really sort of like editing the script um, before it goes into being, it, before it's illustrated. Julian and I, it's it's really like an insular thing. We have the support of our publisher and we've worked with really amazing editors with our publishers, but mostly it's, it's Julian and I going back and forth until the story makes sense to the two of us. Yeah, it's pretty shiny by the time yeah. it reaches an editor. It's crisp by the time uh, it goes out. Oh yeah, here's just another thing again printed out. Uh, and then in hard copy. Yes, these are my, so <laughs> the story behind these, it's sort of like a guide for what they're wearing that day because I, for some stupid reason, well, I know why. Like they wear different clothes every day because I think that's more realistic to the way people are. And also one of the girls is a fashion hound. So she has to have a different outfit every day, but not only a different outfit, different rings on her fingers and different earrings in her ears. And so I don't work chronologically. I jump around so that it does, it's not like super rough at the beginning of the book and then by the end it's super polished. I jump around so it's like page 24, page 115, whatever. But in doing that, like you forget what side her barrette's on, uh, you know? So that's my little guide for like remembering what side of her pants her little rip in her jeans is, so. Speaking of details, why 2009? 
It's because that's a, the the New York I know best. I lived there 2005 to 2000, 2015, and uh, as like a former New Yorker, uh, <laughs> I know that like anybody would be able to tell if a detail was wrong. Like <laughs> those are not the mosaics that like they that are at the like 23rd Street stop. You should know better than that. I see, you know people if you know something about something and then you hear like somebody else get the detail wrong you're just like immediately dismissive of that whole thing <laughs> especially in comics well yeah like somebody will write to you and say did you know that yeah. the that model of train did not run <laughs> yeah. on that line during those years your good reads review is just like nitpicky stuff about new york for this one summer you know it took place in northern ontario a place that i did not know that well uh i mean i'd never been there so we went on a trip like to go you know, experience the place. I think our work is very sensory, so I really wanted to know what it felt like to walk around and how big those trees are and it, it, what is a gravel path, all these th details that, you know, I can't make up in my mind. I want it to reflect a reality and the reality is way more textured and interesting than I could ever make up. So I, this was my plan for uh, roaming as well. Uh, even though I was more familiar with the place. But then COVID hit, so I couldn't uh, go down because the borders were closed. So that was like one complication for it, for it. But at the same time, there was another complication that it was 2009. This is Elizabeth Street, 2022, and this is the same street, 2012. So like the city is not the same anyway. I knew that there was going to be a lot of um, research and reference gathering uh, element of this anyway so uh yeah just a little peek into the madness of that uh what that actually looks like uh this became a Jillian's dropbox dropbox monster <laughs> day one day two day three day four day five and then within every day near you know air train new i'm just reading for the people in the back you know pizza places plane newark airport new york penn station hostel it's all like they all have their little folder and really just, you know, uh, God bless the tourists that just have documented every corner of the city. I really couldn't have done it without you. You know, the Voyager 86 really pulled through for, uh, for me. For by, you know, part one of two videos of the M&M's Times Square store flagship in 2010. I mean, it has 676 views, probably 500 of those are yours. Probably, you know? <laughs> Um, so immensely, immensely helpful. <laughs> um, I ended up being able to go to the the um, the M and M store once, like the borders opened. I could go down, and it really was being like in a place I had like seen in my dreams. I was like, oh my god, there are the like weird dispensing tubes, like that I've like poured my soul into. Um, just, you know, again, Flickr. Flickr was an amazing resource because <laughs> it was popular at that time, right? And people were uploading a lot of photos to that site around that era. And to be honest, I mean, working with Google Images is extremely limiting because the images on Google Images are very corporate. They're like kind of stock images. They're very commercial images now. Um, the images on Flickr are often a people taking a picture of their friend and so it's a much more useful piece of reference to me because it gives the per there's a person in the thing and there's like it, there's just a sense of more you're in it so it, i actually that was an interesting weird little um uh realization <laughs> the depths of the internet and i just included this because this was a very hard one photo there was no photo online of this freaking elevator and escalator in uh, Newark Airport. And it's an important scene where they're wait she's waiting for her friends to come down the uh, escalator. And so I needed to have it, and I paid $30 to go out and take a picture of this escalator <laughs> at Newark Airport. But, you know, I, I also didn't, it just was such a different process from this one summer that I just also thought to lean into it. Like, you're using this reference that is, partially the memories of other people and um lean lean into that there's something this is from google uh like a i don't know what they're called the yeah where the, it's a 3d thing where you can t turn around and look at it from all these angles but there's something there's like a truth in that that's like a little bit more useful to me uh 
and I wanted to lean into the fact that you're using other people's memories to kind of make this book about traveling and these kids' memories. Um, and, it, and there's something about this that kind of shows the truth of being in Times Square a little bit better than just a photograph, right? Like it's like just slip it, snippets of people and people in blurred and people in movements and all this stuff. And so um, kind of tried to take inspiration from that reference as well. And of course, you know, in the end, I think the emotionality of the scene is um, really what should drive the decisions versus a photograph of foot. Because at some point, why draw something if it could be a photograph, right? It's kind of very static and actually not that interesting. I think you need to infuse memory and the emotion and the context to environments to make them really feel uh, like not just photographs, not interesting, melded with the characters and all that stuff. So, and then just wrapping up, uh, it's very funny that we're on this tour and we're having all these new uh, tra travel experiences together because I mean, I think some of our little mishaps have made it into the book as well as yeah. traveling authors. We're Yes, we travel mostly for comics, like for comics and like fueled by comics and then like funded by comics so yeah we're really lucky because yes. a lot of these places i would have never been able to go to without comics and the end that's it that's the end that's our so we're presentation prezi mm -hmm. end <laughs> oh boy can i take this out nope um, thank you so much. That was so enlightening and fun to look through your process and your background. So um, I'm going to keep my questions pretty brief and short and let you expand, but then I want to make sure we have time for everyone to ask questions. Sure. Um, but uh, I have a few questions, and one of them, well, first of all, the book was very meaningful for me because I was a college student in New York exactly at the time Perfect. that this was set. <laughs> so I was sitting next to my partner reading it, and I kept being like, Oh my God, I need to tell you about the first time I went to the M&M store, yeah, right. you know? And I used to, uh, like, sometimes lightly steal some of the ones that ended up yeah. in the grave. And you broken. were just, yeah. yeah, they would, like, leave a bunch there and just kind of, oh, like, grab them. And sure. they got rid of that. They got rid of that. There sure. were too many me. Like, too many students yeah. are coming in here. We don't want to attract that kind of person. Right. <laughs> the free M&M &M person. <laughs> well, yeah, but um, the... I loved all of the um, specific period details, like the map quest, like printing mm -hmm. out map quest and the flip phone and having yeah. to pay an exorbitant amount for roaming. You know, so um, I'm curious why, because you mentioned that you lived in, um, Jillian, that you lived in New York from, you said 2009 to 2015? 2005, or, yeah. Oh, 2005 yeah. to 2015. But the that, like, why this very particular mm -hmm. era of the flip phone with the map quest, you know, because um, if 2015, feels like it's you know so much closer to our era now than 2008 or 2009 was to 2015. I know I feel like that, that era is yeah. just coming into focus. Yeah. It takes like time to undertake process a the era. The music comes back through like remember that music? Um, I do think like one of the things is like a lot of comics or any kind of storytelling is restrictions and also those restrictions are then like helpful so for us, you know, traveling in 2023, it's like we've been saying, it's like you're like, I'm going to look up a pizza place to see. You're not going to go like versus like happening upon a pizza place and you're like, we're going here. Mm -hmm. So there's just elements that are sort of more like rich storytelling wise. If you don't have like a piece, a thing in your hand that's going to that give you all, all the your information. Problems, put you in contact with yeah. your lost travel mates. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I really do like... I think both of us had very potent memories of being like, I have a 100% a memory of my friend Lindy being like, I'm turning on my phone for two seconds, I'm going to find out where we are, and then I'm turning it off and yeah. be like, okay, 50 bucks, 50 mm -hmm. bucks, let's just do it. <laughs> so it's worth I, it. Yeah, exactly. Like, that just seemed like, because it was a thing that I think we both found funny, and it just seemed like such a great story thing, and then, you know, it's like, you're like, is this a good idea? And then you sort of try to see the, like, the fruitfulness of it, and there's just so many storytelling things that were helpful, like, your friend can disappear mm -hmm. if you can't text her. Yeah. Um, and then I think also, you know, I, I think it's, a, I mean, I always think it's a tricky thing to write about now. I think now is amorphous and strange and now it's technology. It's like every time you draw a cell phone, you're like already like, it's already a cell phone of four years ago by the time the book comes out. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something, I like the sort of pointedness of like, it's 1999 or it's like 2009 or whatever it is. And just like being like, we're going to go with all of the things that go with this time period. 
And I think then it also becomes like for Jillian this like, you know, this like little time capsule of like, well, this is like this is already nostalgic. Like we yeah. can already be nostalgic for something that's like, you know, 14 years ago. I was thinking this is just a weird little tangent, but like I think we always talk about cell phones as like automatically dating something. And now or like that could never happen because you would just have a cell phone and you would just call the person and resolve that problem uh but now i now i was realizing that i think like cameras oh yeah are like the like thing that well that would never happen because there would be a camera surveilling that per and they would never right. do that like out in the open like that so it's there's i don't know i was just thinking about that the other day that there's like a new kind of restriction on story yeah. That's like coming up making like a story in 2023. For sure. And I just thought it was so funny. Like there's something funny about near technology. Like so I didn't I couldn't lean into it too much cuz I'm like no young person is going to think that like map roaming quest. fees are funny or like yeah like map <laughs> questing is funny but I think it's funny. So yeah. we got I limited my indulgence to like one joke about it. Right. <laughs> and it is funny. It's it's bizarre, right? I remember losing a friendship over us standing at different sides of the same platform for hours. Yeah. Like, knowing that the other person was there. Yeah, exactly. Right. That like, happens. Like, yeah. Totally. Mm-hmm. But um yeah, that was it was it's very evocative, especially for anyone that has existed in time in that mm-hmm. in that sphere. And the and I think a lot of people, even if they, you know, didn't study in New York or go there for a particular um, length period remember the first time you know that they've been to these places so on that note I'm curious the choice of um, such giant landmarks you mm-hmm. know like you the um, uh, Statue of Liberty and obviously the subway but then there were also things like the halal cart like the famous yeah. halal yeah. cart <laughs> and then those who know will know the halal well, cart well that's the you thing know. that's yeah that's where it did feel like I had um, that little unique point of view right where you can remember being um, seeing that place, and it doesn't actually. It's not even about New York, you know. It's about like any going to any city. It could be about Seoul. It could be about mm-hmm. Berlin or whatever, right? It could be about Toronto, even. Like if you're from a little town, that's a really big place to you. Um, so so um, it, you how to show it so that it's you know the details to make it really feel from an insider, but then you're also viewing it as a tourist and as the outsider and like the awe like when you live in a place for so long you just like the you're just like oh my god it's never going to Times Square ever like oh my god what a drag Mm -hmm. you know but then like the first time it's it is impressive (laughs) like trying to balance both of those things of like remembering what it is like to be awed by something again as a young person that feels very accurate right yeah. and these are places you know we all know from tv and all this right. stuff and you think well, you know like, it like the coffee cups like that's the mm-hmm. other thing right like the monuments are so small they're like these are the law and order coffee cups yeah. it's like that's what i remember yeah like seeking being out being impressed by yeah, yeah i was like sure. let's never throw out this coffee cup <laughs> um i also think like we sort of gave ourselves like this kind of nice structure where like the sort of like the first two acts are like you go to all the places yeah and we kind of like we're able to give ourselves like it's like we said like a lot of stuff got edited out because there's such a wealth of material like all the places Mm -hmm. you can go but then once they're there it kind of takes off into their dynamics Mm -hmm. it's like wherever you go there you are you're like we're in new york and i'm fighting with you because you're being mean to me and i don't know how to handle it like there's like that back and forth between like we're in this place it's overwhelming and it's so big and then it's like our little dynamics in those places and hopefully you know that the the front facing veil that the city presents to a tourist get you the there's cracks in there that you see the real place sometimes and you're like oh yeah like oh yeah not all the city totally caters to me tourists like there are real people that live here and they don't live to just serve me right you know like economic money maker or whatever so, yeah yeah that was well, kind like of fun the, to play with too the scene where they're with like the fake elmo that's like give me money for taking my yeah. picture yeah. Mm-hmm. that was like such a moment for me where i was like oh so cute and they were like give me money and i was like what mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah 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 i had an altercation with someone throwing like a coke can at me i'm like okay okay welcome yeah. to new york yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so many like very visceral moments that even if you don't exper- you haven't experienced that mm-hmm. specific thing, there's a universality mm-hmm. to that kind of tourist experience. Um, I wanted to ask about kind of the Asian American dimension or Asian Canadian and and um, our dimension. Your, yeah, yeah. Well, because it's such an integral part of the ending, or or, or um, it comes up in certain sections in the 
dialogue between um, between the girls. And I know that in previous books, like um, Skim, um, uh, which you should read because it's incredible, uh, there's a character who the way that um, the protagonist is drawn right refers to a um, like Heian Japanese um, like style of drawing, or at least it mm-hmm. seemed like that that way to me, where um, the kind of visuals kind of portray something that might be not necessarily as explicit in the narrative. So um, I noticed it kind of cropping up in this book as well, and I'm, I'm wondering uh, what um, like connection you see between this book and your previous work, and um, you know the fact that Fiona is is white, and then the other characters um, not like what you know. Um, just wanted to mm-hmm. help you know yeah. say a little bit more about that. I but. mean, I think um, we write about Asian people because we are Asian people. That's the sort of like bedrock of it all, and I think that we don't tend to write. I mean. This, again, becomes like the whole identity piece. We don't tend to explicitly write about race, but our characters are of a certain are a certain mm-hmm. race. So, you know, it's like they it comes up as it as it comes up in conversation. But I think we're never we're never really leaning into sort of explicit themes. Um, it's interesting because I like I think with regards to Fiona's whiteness, I mean, first of all, like. Uh, all my friends when I was in high school were mm-hmm. white with very few exceptions. So that's just sort of part of the, you know, of our experience and, and what we both know. Um, and I, it's funny cause I also think, you know, the thing about this book is that all of the characters have conflicts. Mm-hmm. They're all, it's like people were, many people have said to us like, Fiona's so mean. It's like, they're all mean. <laughs> they're all mean to each other. They all are playing. The off two girls like, that are friends are actually the meanest they're to, so each mean other to each because other. Because nobody can be, meaner to you if they know you very well yeah you know what i mean because they just they know exactly where to poke you yeah the deepest you know? stabs are between danny and zoe because yeah. they're so hurt by each other but i do think you know like there's so many dynamics of play there's like you know we said there's dynamics of class there's dynamics of race there's dynamics of gender and sexuality and like you know i think everybody is sort of holding these different spots in such a way that like there's yeah there's so many sources of conflict and I think we just try to be, or, you know, like, I think in everything I write, it's just like an effort to be in someone's skin in that space and all the things that they're dealing with, as opposed to, like, trying to, like, send a specific message about what that means. I mean, I think that some of the relate the dynamics between all the characters are, well, I mean, that that time, that 19-year-old, you're, like, meeting, you're going to, if you go to college or university for the first year, you're just, you're... You meet these people that you never ever meet before, and they are all, are all coming with their own backgrounds, you know. And so it is inspired by um, hanging out with a lot of other Asians for the first time. Sure. Like I had grown up in Calgary, and like had a, uh, my best friend was Korean, but like other than that, there were not a ton of Asians around in the in the part of Calgary that I'm from. Um, and then when I went to Queen's University in Ontario, where all these kids from Toronto had come to this university, like I had, d- did not know, like I was new to like learning about Asian pop culture, you know, uh, and it's not even Japanese. It's like just sort of like pan-Asian American culture, whatever that, that is. But I knew nothing about it. I didn't know like even the cliches I didn't even, the stereotypes I didn't know. So that I think that I'm drawing on some of that um with between their f- the friendship between Danny and Zoe and then also meeting people that had never met an Asian ever right. you know and like gently telling them that some of the things they said were not right so it's like uh cuz they were from very small towns so some of that is some of those real, some of those dynamics are in the characters here too yeah and i think too like the sort of other side of that is that Zoe is queer um, but she's newly queer. She's like just shaved her head for the first time queer, you know, mm-hmm. so she's just mm-hmm. slowly figuring out what that means. And, you know, I think that there's like sort of like a meta question about like, what does this mean about identity? It's like, well, to Zoe, it means a whole bunch of things and nothing to Zoe just means like, am I going to get laid? That would be so awesome. <laughs> this person looks like she wants to sleep with me. Like how much your characters think beyond that and sort of like honoring that as opposed to trying to say something meta like I think there's a lot of opportunities certainly for like Zoe to say things about how Fiona's behaving but she's you know so caught up in her own stuff that 
And you don't. Like, you don't make any comments about that kind of thing when you're newly hurt or, you know, really into somebody. Yeah. Yeah. That's just our style, too. Yeah. It's very Canadian. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. That time period in someone's life is also so raw, right? Yeah. When you're right in between, you're 19, 20, you're... Um, experiencing all of these new things at the same time so there's a sort of new newly a deer kind of moments where Mm -hmm. you're nearly newly queer or you're in a new city and they're all there and um, there's an awkward beauty to making all those mistakes yeah well Mm -hmm. you're sort of saying like I don't think I even realized this as we were working on it but I've said it a couple times but uh, at the with the first two books they were very closed worlds it was like the closed world of the like cloistered uh, girl, all girl private school, you know? And then the second was like the family unit, like in a little cottage for two weeks or whatever. They're very sort of closed little worlds. And then this one is like totally expansive and they're a little tiny little unit in the whole world, basically. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of get their little particles atoms get pulled apart and then they're all free floating for a bit but um so that was that like inverse of that mm-hmm. yeah yeah um i just have one question before we sure. um turn it over to the audience and that's i'm just curious how you started your collaboration so your mm-hmm. um cousins right mm-hmm. and uh, uh one day you met like let's do this like how did <laughs> let's 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 do the thing like how did your collaboration start um because you mentioned in the presentation you didn't really hang out that much mm-hmm. as kids not like, at all how yeah did it happen? yeah uh I was in Toronto and there was a literary magazine called Kiss Machine um which was I mean like fairly well known within sort of Toronto literary magazine circles which is like like 300 people or whatever <laughs> um but the woman who edited it was into comics and she was like I want to do comics that are written by women and, and like illustrated by women and I want to give like women a chance to sort of try comics in this like as like a you know being published by this magazine to do a mini comic, and it was also people that had never done comics before. Yeah, it was like a yeah, that was like explicitly in it. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was like yeah. very Toronto thing. Do you want to try to do this? Do you want to try this? I like got you... some money from the government. Yeah, do, do you want, want some money? Like, a oh, little bless. bit of money. Do you want to do this thing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I had literally like I had this postcard that I was like carrying around all the time that was of this like illustration that. Uh, the Jillian had done that she had her like little illustrator postcards yeah because uh, it was a school project because I was doing freelance illustration yeah I think it was this time. one with like carrots for legs or something like that oh yeah that was the edible woman like yes. the Margaret Atwood so yeah. I you yeah. know had this thing I think I even like had it on me because I just like had it in my like date book and I was like my cousin is an illustrator yeah she just graduated yeah she yeah. just graduated she's obviously super talented and then you know Emily who was the editor was like would she do it and I was like maybe <laughs> Um, yeah, and then, like, I we've said this many times, like... The, and that, that ended up being a 24-page yeah. black and white little standalone thing. Yeah, like, we've that said... That ended up being the first part of our graphic novel. For, yeah, sorry, yeah so ahead. it was a very... What I was going to say, it's, it's yeah. a very low-stakes project. Yeah. She was like, do you want to do this 24-page thing? So versus calling my cousin, who I never talked to, and being like, do you want to make a book with me? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, it's 24 pages, and we'll try it, and maybe it'll be horrible, but maybe yeah. it'll be really great. And yeah. it just so happened that it was really great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we kept getting sort of, I think we were able to try something, we're able to see like that our styles worked really well together. And then sort of like, you know, it just sort of exploded from there. And we had then the opportunity to, I remember going around to the little comic book stores and like selling it on consignment. And like, I sent it to like all the publishers and the mail and just started going to comic convention, little comic conventions and zine conventions. Cause we suddenly had a book to like share with people and like some of those people that I we met at those very very first conventions are, I'm still friends with today yeah. like it really did give us just a little thing to just enter yeah like, the Canadian comics community world. has been incredibly supportive to us and I you know like Skim even as like a little 20 page comment won on like an honorable mention for the Doug Wright Awards like you know when it came out mm-hmm. like I feel like from the beginning they were like yeah do you want to yeah. do this like there was never any sense of you know I do think that's the thing about being a Canadian artist, there's no sense that anything is impossible. Mm-hmm. The envy. It's not going to make you any money, <laughs> yeah. but it's yeah. not impossible, is the idea. Yeah. Great. So why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. Um, the, so you have a character with an amazing wardrobe. I love the note that it was seemingly endless accessories and clothes. <laughs> and thank you for showing how you kept track of what else was it more 
extra work or was it more fun having that distraction of the character's clothes? Oh, hello. Um, and so uh, how did you get the visual references for the clothes the character's wearing? Because this is like prime fashion blog time right totally. now. Totally, <laughs> totally. Like, obviously, like you obviously were doing the work, but what, from Thank where? you. I thought it was fun. I mean, I actually don't love uh, uh, concepting like the character that much. I kind of just, I'm like, One's got to be tall, and one's got to be short, and one's got to have long hair, and one's got to have short. Like that's more useful. Yeah, like ultimately, exactly. Got to have a fat one and a thin one. You got to be able to tell them apart. <laughs> you got to tell them apart from like the yeah. distance. You know, mm. that's more important than some of the details. But it was just, I am not a fashionista myself, but I have a great appreciation for that. And like it was just so that character to have for the five day trip to bring a whole freaking suitcase full of stuff and like three different jackets. And you're just like, that's great. Like that's yeah. again, like just so youthful and fun to me. Um, there is a little Easter egg uh, underneath the cover that is um, kind of representative of one of my huge influences, which is like Betty and Veronica, like fashion pages where you could like, as a kid, you could like write in and draw a picture to Archie Comics and like mail in your fashion for Betty and Veronica, and then they would, they would maybe choose yours and draw, the the fashion that you had sent in. I just like love that so oh much. I gosh. mean, I think I learned how to draw off of like Archie Comics. To yeah, agree. there's a Betty and Veronica issue that's about Betty trying different hairstyles mm-hmm. that I remember to this day. Like I could be looking, I could like recreate it for you. <laughs> I'm so obsessed with it. Yeah, I also yeah. think the good thing about Fiona's the best thing about Fiona's outfits to me is that it immediately sets her apart as being like way ahead of everybody else it's like danny's like i'm wearing my toque and fiona's like i'm kind of doing sheepskin and i'm doing like a yeah that that coat that coat that 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 girl Mm -hmm. has that coat and danny's just like i don't have the coat yeah danny's little i think tell i mean besides the overalls is like she has a moomin like tote bag which is so like a girl. Yeah. yeah. You know? The overalls. <laughs> yeah. I love her overalls. Yeah. I noticed that in the concepts. It's like the, the, the character's philosophy is moving. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> she lives by, that's her life philosophy is yeah. moving. Yeah. yeah. For sure. And that's, a, that's funny. It's like, it's not a detail uh, that like, she doesn't even mention Moomins, mm-hmm. but it just is such a small thing that helps you understand that character a little yeah. bit. She you know? is Moomin. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Just getting a little boat and paddling to her little mm-hmm. island. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other questions? Oh, press it up. I think we can hear. Oh. Is it working? I yeah. Know. Oh, okay, cool. Um, hi. Hi. Um, <laughs> Uh, first of all, I, it was so fantastic hearing about the research process and like combing through all of these like weird family, you know, tourist videos and whatnot. That was really fun to hear. Um, I have a question about process. Um, and so you two mentioned how with um, this book, you were able to uh, send a pretty shiny finished copy to the editors um, and that you, because you've already, you know, built up this trust with them. Um, so I'm curious, you know, what kind of editorial feedback you did receive, um, but also maybe, you know, flashing back, and this is definitely coming from a place of someone who makes comics and also someone who occasionally this edits comics. Yeah. <laughs> gonna, gonna well, happen um, really, you know, the lessons, like, you know, one of the struggles with, like, editing comics is not is like when in the process to send it because you know send it too early right. and you're like oh well all of the writing has changed and we did all of these edits on the writing and now like none of it's even there anymore yeah. but send it too late and you're like oh my god i have to redraw like the entire thing um so yeah i don't know like any lessons learned through the various different processes of editing um or you know what you wish maybe early on like you have editors a really, asked for you're you. sitting next to this is a great person to ask because you are an editor i am in, in, for shirley books at abrams i am Press. so you now have the on the side of at the editor too yes in addition to the editee yes so i'm go. on both sides now <laughs> um i would say that the thing that you're really sending to a publisher and you should also first of all you should pick the publisher that is making the books that you already yeah. love yeah you know, as opposed to like a bunch of publishers. So you pick the publisher that you're like, you seem to like the stories that I like. And then really what you're sending, and it 
changes dramatically as soon as you have your first book out. Because as soon as you have your first book out, the publishers know who you are and they know your work and they have a sense of the stories you tell. Because really what you're selling to a publisher is you. And you're saying like, this is the kind of story I want to tell, which they're into. But then it's also like, this is what it's going to look like. So you are really giving them like, this is the kind of thing I'm going to create. And every publisher knows that it's going to change. Like, I think that there's a version of it where you can send something that's quite finished. And there's a version where the publisher's like, this is great. And we love this. But most often, publishers are going to have in input and sort of thoughts and you know, it's like we said, like, if you look at what we did from our script to what it ends up being, there's so many things that change and publishers know that. So I think what you want to send to a publisher is really like a clarity that you have a beginning, middle and end to your story and a very clear vision of what it's going to look like and what your illustration style is. And then uh, and then it's just like if it's a good fit, like I wouldn't send a finished story. Um, or I wouldn't imagine that the story that I get approved even or purchased by a publisher is a finished story. Like this one summer, if you look at our pitch versus yeah, what really we made, different. it's completely different. Yeah. But they knew what Skim was and they knew what we sort of did and they knew that we were going to like eventually find our way to a book that they were going to like. So, yeah. yeah but and it's, some of it's, you can do everything right and still have an, a rocky experience. I yeah. don't know. Like you can't, we've been really lucky, but I mean, I do, I do a ton of work and a lot of editorial work and you just never know sometimes, right? It's just yeah. the luck of the draw or the bad luck of the draw sometimes of, of a mismatch. But that's why you do your, do really due diligence, uh, choosing who you work with in the first place and that is that's where all your networking pays off because then you can ask people who have worked with whoever and all that stuff yeah so. also graphic novels are insanely hard yeah it's so much stuff to have any clarity on yeah. at the beginning of the process like i do think it's like every graphic novel even the ones we've worked on when you start you're like i don't know this mm -hmm. is just like a bunch of ideas and then when you get to the end of it you're like yeah, this is completely different than we thought it was going to be, but I do think that that is something that publishers know, and yeah, it is complicated, but that's what do I would say. Do your best. Do your best. <laughs> that's all you can do. Yeah. <laughs> Another question? So uh, this is drawn in quarterly, and this one summer was first, second. How do you decide like when you have worked with specific publishers in the past? How do you decide who you go to? Yeah, that, that's I had worked with drawn in quarterly quite a, a bit. Yeah, um, and it definitely like I had published Boundless, which was a collection of like adult comics, uh, not at not those kinds of adult comics, yes. but comics for adult people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had that relationship and um, it did feel like it was uh, like an adult book, a new adult book. It was not a YA book, so it did feel like that would be a match. And I knew they would do yeah. a beautiful job for it. And we did, for a second, did very well by us for... Yeah. Uh, I feel like it is... I don't have any allegiances to no. like... But like, yeah. I feel... Because I do so many different kinds of books. I can do kids' books. I do freaking like like young you know almost middle grade books i do at books for adults <laughs> uh so i think it's so important to find the right publisher for the right book like yeah. that's really like even there isn't like ki not all my kids books might be with the same publisher i feel like there's a right home for the right for every book and I, yeah, yeah i think we're both people like i work with abrams and i work with we've worked with you know uh i've worked with for a second and I think at some point you're just, yeah, you really do have to find the right home. And I think, you know, hopefully your career is long and you'll do other books with other publishers other time. Like, I do think it's it's kind of like, um, yeah. yeah. Why, like, yeah, why have allegiances? Not the 60s. It's not the 60s <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's our answer. It's not the 60s anymore. <laughs> Another question? Uh, so we have a question from the YouTube. Oh. Uh, okay. From and the this is a question <laughs> for <laughs> Jillian. Um, so how is drawing and specifically sequential art a form of writing? And for both of you, what can images do that words can't and vice versa? Ooh, la la, la 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 la. That's some metaphysical mm -hmm. stuff from the YouTube what channel. Do images, <laughs> what do images, that's like an ephemeral question from the internet. That's um, a, yeah. 
I absolutely think like uh, the sequential image aspect is writing. And that's where, why I love, and I actually love that challenge of taking your whole cloth texts with the case of Skim in this one summer. And there's so much storytelling that happens like on that image level. Like, yeah. and, the, and the fun part is playing in the space between text and image. Like in reality, that is the reading, is the space in between. It's kind of bad cartooning to show, just illustrate the, the, the text. You know what I mean? Like, to, like this is happening, so I show this happening. Yeah, there has to be a space in between words and pictures for, off, you know, for the most part, so that there's actual reading that's happening. You're not just like I don't know, inputting information. Uh, there, that's that, and I love pushing and pulling that space where sometimes you actually have to work to try to like understand. And some of it, sometimes it's because somebody's expression contradicts what they're saying. Right. right. Yeah. I think we're constantly learning with every book, too. Like, I think with Skim, like, you know, the diary text of Skim, which is the captions, is so internal and so emotional. Yeah, it was written like a diary. It is. Yeah, yeah, it was written as a diary. And so it's like you have this incredibly internal thing. And it was like the first time I saw, oh, you can, you know, it the external world can completely contradict what's happening internally. And then you sort of discover mm -hmm. that tool and you're like, well, that's amazing. And then with this one summer, there are no, there's very few captions in this one summer. And it's really about, you know, those dynamics between people, like what they're yeah. saying and, and what's happening. That and that's the most like, cinematic one, I would say. Yes. And I did really want something very classical or straightforward. Yeah. And that was, and it, it is much more difficult to like, <laughs> to make a comic with no narration. Yeah, yeah. it's so hard. And yeah. that's why you see like how much narration there is in superhero comics because it's so hard to like convey this stuff without it. Um, and then I think it's like, you know, I think that roaming is kind of a combination of all these things. It's like this really, it is this kind of sense of like, yeah, like what can you put on the page that is telling a story that is contradicting and also supporting whatever you have your character seeing and going through. Like it is just like all of these elements. And well, I think yeah. not putting a rule on what words are and what pictures are is kind of key. I think as soon as you define a lane for them, yeah, you're they like should bounce it. off. They should match. Sometimes they should totally contradict other times. They should like get close. Sometimes I think that there's like a playfulness you can have between those levels of writing or yeah writing i mean that there are writing in a way storytelling that's yeah. the right word i'm looking for with with roaming it was uh i gave myself permission to be more experimental and more psychedelic mm -hmm. and like uh surreal uh because that felt right for the story and it was a departure from this one summer which was very like that was my challenge to myself was to be quite straightforward and like clean almost <laughs> Um, so, yeah. 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 Thank you, YouTube person. Yeah. I was really struck by those moments where, um, when there was, especially when there was something extremely emotional or exciting or difficult that was happening between the characters, that kind of psychedelic, um, bleeds and spreads mm -hmm. and, um, I'm not going to reveal the, there's, but there's a, um, kind of fantastic, like a play with me memory and fantasy yeah. at the end that yeah. I was just... Very, I was very, very struck by and, and loved. Cool. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, do we have time for maybe one question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this has been such a treat. Thank you. Uh, I'm really curious. I'm so glad this one is up because oh, yeah. I'm really curious about some of the aesthetic decisions and the spreads. They feel really different than some of the illustrations I've seen before. And they. I'm curious about your aesthetic influences because they look to me like commercial lithography printed children's books the way mm. the like key layer disappears in the background and you're playing with the yeah yeah i mean so I, i'm such a f student you know mm. um i'm a little but i'm not an academic you know i just love things uh and absolutely i mean i come from a commercial illustrate i still do commercial illustration like that is a part of me and i just love uh that work and it's just going to be in my DNA, right? Uh, with this book, um, I am not, I'm a drawer, you know, like I am not a painter. Sometimes I try to be a painter, but I am not a painter. To my great chagrin, I am a drawer. <laughs> and um, I uh, didn't want to do this book in a brush pen, which I had done the previous books 
with uh, just because I was kind of bored of that and kind of moved on from that. And I had done a comic in a um, couple of, like many years ago now, I guess 2018, and it was it was called Ned, and it was a short story, and I had done it in this style, which is essentially a silk screen. You know, that's the process. And so that's where I think some of the traditional vibes come in. You know, even though it's totally digital, you're taking the, the sensibility uh, and the process of silk screening and making them digital. And I again, it's be free within the constraint. And I think I'm like, uh, painting can feel infinite. And that's what I have a problem with. I really love having the constraint of just three colors or four colors if you count the paper or whatever. Um, and then find pushing that to its limit and really playing with the variation that because it's just it's it's not limitless, but almost is limitless, right? So that is uh, that is where that look probably comes from. It is from I mean, literally, the, if you looked at the Photoshop or Procreate file, it would be tan blue and black <laughs> and they and they never the twain shall meet they just they stay separate and you could literally click them on and off and it's a silk screen you know you could you could silk screen any of these uh spreads if you had a big enough uh, screen <laughs> to get the detail but you could yeah and that's where that comes from i think all right um thank you so yeah, much those are great thank questions you everybody thank you so thank much you. Thank you so much for coming to Philadelphia and for talking to our students and community. Um, we'll, uh, you'll be selling the yes. book and signing. We'll so. be signing. Yeah. Someone else will be selling yes. and then we'll sign them. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so thank much, you, everybody. Everybody. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. <laughs> Can I ask you to sign my copy? Yeah, it's really quickly. Cool. I have a pen here. Yay! Thank you. Just here, look. <laughs>